Hello, thank you for joining us and welcome to this session on an introduction to our participatory economy. My name is Jason, I'm an activist in London and I'll be chairing the panel. Capitalism excludes million, millions of us from decision making. How can we instead organize an economy based on democracy, solidarity and cooperation? That's the central question we'll be exploring in this panel. Our speakers will be introducing a democratic economic system called a participatory economy, which has been proposed as a viable alternative to capitalism. It's been developed by radical economists and activists Michael Albert and Robin Hanel in the 1990s and has received growing interest since. So before we start, a few quick reminders. Please could all participants turn off their microphones when they're not speaking. So just click the, the mute button if you're not, if you're not speaking. This workshop is being recorded and I believe only 12 people can have their video camera on at the same time. So priority will be given to those who are speaking. Right, so I'm very happy to welcome Peter Bomer. Uh, Peter teaches political economy at Evergreen State College in Washington and he's been active in social movements around racism and economic justice since the late 1960s, including community education in prisons. He's been active in advocating participatory socialism as an alternative to capitalism. He'll start by introducing and briefly comparing the different socialist models that exist. Next, we have Yuna Hermani Mackinnon, who is a teacher, freelance journalist, and activist in Helsinki, Finland. He's co founder of Parakan Finland, an organization which promotes a participatory economy. He's written in uh, for Jacobin magazine and is co-author of the book, The Welfare System Strikes Back. He will be introducing the key features of a participatory economy. And third, we have Fintan Bradshaw, who hopefully will be able to join us. He's having a few technical issues. But Fintan, Fintan is an activist in Dublin and is part of the participatory economy project and has advocated participatory socialism for over 15 years. He will talk about participatory economy and environmental sustainability. Uh, then we will have 30 minutes of discussion at the end. So if you have a question, there are two ways you can ask. You can um, write your question directly into the chat in the right of the screen. Or if you'd like to ask directly, there's a virtual hand you can click under the chat. Uh, I, reaction buttons, I believe. And then we will put your camera on. Okay, so this is going to be a very brief overview of a participatory economy. If you would like to find out more, this is the website to go to where you can find out articles, videos, ask questions and join the community forum. I'll post a link into the chat later. There's also some other talks during, during the Democratizing Work Conference that you are related as, that you might be interested in. Uh, there's a Democratic Economic Planning book discussion, which starts in an hour's time. And there's also Democratic Planning in the Environment, which is on Thursday. Right, that's it from me. Oh, and there are also some, some books. Um, you can find out more about the model. I can uh, share these again later at the end of the session. Okay, so I'll pass over to you, Peter. Would you like me to share your notes for you? Uh, you're you're un you're muted, Peter. Just need to turn your microphone on. Should be the micro microphone button at the bottom. I'm afraid we still can't hear you. Okay. 
We did have this working before the session, everyone, so apologies for the delay. I don't know, is it, uh, Billy, is it possible to unmute Peter's microphone? I can only mute someone else's microphone. I cannot unmute someone's microphone. Okay. <clears throat> Peter, can you hear us? Uh, do you mind checking in in the chat if you can hear us? Okay, I think uh, I got it. I hit the ball. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear you now, Peter. Excellent. Okay, so Jason, if you could do the first page, and sorry for that delay, everybody. I yep. welcome everybody here, and uh, looking forward to listen to the other panelists too. And uh, thanks to Billy for helping with the technical problems. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to talk about in the next twenty minutes are different conceptions of socialism, and you know, I'll then prepare. But June is going to talk about participatory socialism. Okay, so first, uh, my definition of socialism is the idea of popular control and production and use of the surplus. So the idea of a surplus above what a society needs to reproduce uh, is popular control of that, or at least a movement toward the popular control of the surplus. This means to me ending private ownership and that the control of the surplus is necessary but not sufficient for socialism. So again, the idea is that ending private ownership of like the means of production, of capital, of businesses, that that must end, but that's not, uh, that's not sufficient for the definition of socialism. So if we consider this idea of popular control of the production and use of the surplus, that socialism implies uh, to me five different things. That the means of production, the resources, the capital that produces wealth is socialized. It's not owned by individuals. Two, that production is organized around meeting people's needs, not profits, right? So the idea is what's produced is to meet uh, human needs, not to produce profit. But if we talk about a popular control of the surplus at the micro level of the firm, it means self-management, which will be discussed more in these other panels, or work control at the workplace. Fourthly, uh, democratic and popular control of the government, so that both popular control at the workplace, at, at, at the level of the government, at the government. Uh, and in this movement toward a socialist society, there may be independently owned small businesses. For example, uh, what I call the independent mode of production. Like, the, like for example, in Cuba, there, for many years, there have been these small family owned restaurants called Paladars, which would be example that could exist in the movement toward socialism. So again, so let me define next before I get into various forms of socialism, how the words often used, even though I'm going to argue many of them are not really socialist, that the surplus, uh, you see in the middle of my notes there, what I mean by surplus more specifically, I have a diagram on the next page I'll get to in a minute, okay? So the surplus means we think of any society produces a certain output. Some of that output uh, must go to what I call socially necessary consumption of the population, both reproductive consumption as well as other, minus the depreciation of capital and nature. So if capital and nature are used up, that must be replaced for that society to, to reproduce. In other words, what's left over after the consumption needs of society are met and maintaining the environment? The amount above that is called the surplus. And this, I'm very influenced here by particularly a guy, Paul Baran, in a book called Political Economy of Growth, a book from the 1960s, a very influential and worthwhile book. So a key aspect of society is who produces the surplus, who controls the surplus, and who decides how it's used. So who produces it, who controls the surplus, how 
who decides how it's used, and then finally how it's used. For example, is it used for investment, reinvestment, to let's say increase productivity or maybe decrease the amount of labor necessary? Is it used on luxury consumption? Is it used on military expenditures or for health, education, social surpluses? Again, in this socialist society, the production of the surplus and its use decided by the society, by the public, not by corporations or even a, a state separated from the people. So to me, socialism, before I, I kind of show this in a diagram, socialism to me is a movement towards the popular control of the surplus. So we think of socialism giving the economic sphere, but if we think of popular control of the surplus, the end point is also democracy in all aspects of society. If we start from the political, we're saying democracy in a political level, the full extension of democracy, including over people's work and lives, is socialism. So to me, socialism and democracy need to come together. Again, democracy with a small D, not the capital D, you know, of the Democratic Party of the United States, a very pro-capitalist party. So central to socialism is substantive or participatory democracy and also equality in all aspects of life. So the idea is, in this view of socialism, socialism and democracy cannot be separated. Jason, could you move to the next page? Thanks. In my notes. Okay, so here briefly, uh, I talked about the surplus. So the idea in a socialist society, the surplus, the, uh, we look at the circle meaning output, uh, and I'm including both uh, market economy and let's say the household. So again, production takes place in the household. In my view, also there's useful goods and services like childcare, uh, cooking, cleaning, that's being done in the household too. So uh, if we look at this total society, don't think about money. Output is part, the whole circle, subtract from that necessary consumption, socially necessary consumption, and then depreciation of the means of production and the environment, the impact on the environment, that's the surplus, okay? So I'm gonna be using this idea in talking about, in thinking about uh, socialism, okay? So let me move now to the next part of uh, my outline. So I'm gonna talk about common uses of the word socialism and maybe communism also, but briefly, okay? So the first one, is what I call centrally planned societies, okay? Think of the former Soviet Union. Sometimes society will call communists, even though they didn't call themselves communists because the Communist Party controlled the state. In, in a centrally planned society, uh, which is kind of rapidly disappearing as examples, you usually have a centrally planned society led by a vanguard party which supposedly represents the ideals of that society, the most committed people. In this uh, centrally planned society, there's a very limited uh, private property, uh, and I'll define private property more in a second, where the means of production are owned by the state. And in this view, the Communist Party, usually the only party that is really permitted, uh, claims to represent the people. Uh, so again, just like there's different versions of capitalism, different versions of centrally planned societies. And I would argue, but I don't really have time today, that, that Cuba has been the best version of this model. Although still there's some real economic problems in Cuba, mainly a U.S. blockade, but not only that. Uh, and Cuba in some ways is moving away from this model, you know, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, trying to find a more sustainable model. So. There's more use of markets, private businesses, and also cooperatives in Cuba. But in this model, I often call the Marxist-Leninist model, access to education is often usually healthcare for all. It's far more equal than most capitalist societies, uh, both in income and wealth distribution, but continually major problems with production of quality goods, particularly agriculture, uh, lack of democracy, certainly lack of work control, very much one person management. Sometimes this model is called authoritarian capitalism or state capital, excuse me, authoritarian socialism or state capitalism. 
To me, this model is neither socialist, lack of popular control, nor would I call it capitalist in the sense that there isn't production for profit. So I would argue it's a new social formation that's neither capitalist nor, nor socialist. Uh, by private property, I'm using in a sense not of personal property, like not like your toothbrush or your car, if, you have, if they're cars, but I mean property you can make money of, like uh, a landlord you know, owning many other houses. Uh, but of course, there's little restriction as on, on, on personal property, okay? So that's the first model. Uh, the second model, briefly, of, of use the word socialism, is what I call, or many people call market socialism. Think of, for example, the former Yugoslavia before it collapsed. There's public ownership of the means of production. Uh, income is from people's work and labor, not from capital, like in a capitalist society. Uh, this model is favored, I think, by most US left economists, supposedly combines efficiency through the and choice of markets with equity. Uh, so to me, the problem of market socialism, which I think is certainly an advance from capitalism, even social democracy, which I'll get to next, even uh, in a market socialist society, right? So we're talking about ownership of capitalists publicly owned, uh, and but there's markets to determine prices and wages and uh, interest rates. So in this model, each firm tries to minimize costs. But you know, that's you know, has very mixed feelings. Minimizing costs, some things might be good, not wasting resources, but also it means tending to speed up workers because of competition between firms. Again, prices and wages set in the market. In this model, firms maximize profits. Profits go back then either to the firm or society or you know, or maybe the government. So some other problems. Uh, briefly on this model. So incomes before taxes are likely to be, you know, quite unequal, although it can be moderated somewhat by taxes, right? People who add a lot of, uh, you know, revenue to a firm are going to make higher wages in this model is to be bidding for them. So income will be very unequal. It can be moderated somewhat by, uh, by taxes. Uh, Competition between enterprise to lower costs, again, it's mixed. I think it may be, you know, trying to lower environmental costs, labor costs, you know, things like pollution. There's a tendency to externalize them in a, in a market social society. So there's a tendency, again, to income inequality and the social cost of production being uh, externalized society. Also, maybe most importantly to me, it tends to foster individualism rather than cooperation and solidarity among people. Profit maximizing behavior, not socialist and cooperative and empathetic and socially conscious human beings. So it tends to foster uh, what I call individualism. And I'm separating here individuality versus individualism. By individualism to me, uh, it's me, 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 thinking about basically yourself. Individuality, on the other hand, and they're often confused, is furthering development of human beings to develop their individual talents, personality needs. A socialist society should further individu individuality, but reduce and not incentivize individualism. Okay. Thirdly, briefly, uh, social democracy. Think of the Nordic or the Scandinavian countries. You know, we have uh, some speakers from there. Uh, the New Democratic Party of Canada, you know, AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Bernie Sanders. To me, social democracy is a regulated capitalism. It's more equal than U.S. capitalism. It usually means progressive taxes, family leave, free health care, free education, including higher education, ending or at least reducing poverty. However, usually bureaucratic, there's problems, particularly in the global capitalist economy, we live under problems of capital flight. If you try to regulate capital too much, or capital strike, capital is saying we're not going to invest until you can give us higher profits. Increasingly, social democracy has reduced socialism away from public ownership to and Keynesianism with a social wage and some regulations. 
often when in power, social democratic parties uh, have had little concern about environmental problems. Although the Greens in Europe, uh, I think they're somewhat different. I would call them social democratic. Uh, social democratic parties are often imperialist, uh, nationalists supporting their own countries in war. Typically, we've seen that in Europe. The base of the party has traditionally been labor unions. Today, there's a movement by social democratic parties away from even full employment policies as labor-based, like new labor in Britain. Is social democracy capitalism? Yes. Of course, not all capitalisms are the same, uh, but still even a, a more equal and better capitalism, still uh, alienated labor, unequal limitations for social democracy in a capitalist world, especially in the global south. So for all three of these models of socialism, centrally planned or market socialist or social democratic, uh, Michael Albin, Robin Hanel, who Jason mentioned in introduction, they raised the issue of a new class society, the coordinator class. I tend to call it the professional managerial class in control. They argue that the hierarchical division of labor in all of these models will negatively affect all aspects of social life. The problems of managers and, and managers as, as permanent positions, as permanent groups. In my view, it's all right to have a management specific project, but maybe not as a profession. This is overcome in participatory socialism or participatory economics, which our next speaker, uh, Juna, will develop. Okay, turn page up, uh, please. Okay, okay, just because a country calls itself socialist, socialist doesn't make it so. That's one of my points of this talk. South Africa under apartheid called itself democratic. You know, the US or Israel calls itself democratic. To me, it doesn't make it so. Nor does China calling itself uh, socialist make it socialism. Okay, let me briefly, because I know I'm running out of time, talk about uh, one more model and then uh, kind of wrap up. Okay, so the fourth model, uh, you see at the top of the page, different names often out in, in the Pacific Northwest, bioregionalism, sometimes called gift economy, local economy, I call it community-based economics. Kind of the view, you know, going back to Schumacher, the idea of small is beautiful. And it's preferred by many uh, local, many activists today, primarily it's focus on local production, limited trade, possibly trade between communities through barter, but mainly the idea of toward communities being as self-sufficient as possible. The idea is face-to-face -face contact. This will overcome alienation. It'll be more sustainable, less energy costs and transportation, strength of self-management, and the idea of food sovereignty is also a part. Uh, problems of this model, I'll go through them very briefly because of time. Uh, one is economies of scale. Right, economies of scale means costs reduced if produced on a bigger scale. In this local economy, you really want each com commodity producing, you know, their own antibiotics, steel, software, subway cars, MRI, machines, vaccines. So problems, economies of scale would really be missing. Two, should people be richer in richer regions? That's not equitable because a region has more resources. It doesn't give people the right, it seems to me, to be richer and you have that problem if you would have these small local economies. Three, how is, even within a community, if we're talking, let's say about, I don't know, 100,000 people, how is production distribution work organized within a community? Is it small firms, profits? And then how is trade, uh, trade exchange, production organized between communities? Uh, and finally, how are problems such as climate change, global pandemics, water quality dealt with? Okay, so those are four models. The participatory socialism, uh, to me, it's the variant of libertarian or democratic socialism. It could, and as many, it could be considered anarchist. Some, you know, many of the people I work with call themselves anarchists and often are very attracted to this model. The labels can be confusing. For example, Thomas Piketty in his new book, A Capital and Ideology, calls his alternative history socialism. But the terminology I'm using, his model is social democracy, 
which is reformed capitalism. So a few more comments in closing. One, I want to argue there's a need for an alternative. It's, it's, it's so important to be critical of capitalism. We need both an alternative and a strategy uh, to get there. Because without socialist alternatives, we're limited to reforms of capital, but they're always trade-offs. And reforms may be reversed. For example, if we raise the minimum wage, let's say in the United States, to, uh, to a living wage, let's say 25 to $30 an hour, will firms close and lay off people? That needs to be considered. So again, uh, reforms also can be reversed. Then it's also, in terms of this model, this danger of social engineering. So this, to me, is kind of a vision that, of course, they must be interact and be altered by social movements. And also, visions must be historically and culturally specific. They're not, not blueprints. So different in the US from Mexico, Honduras, South Africa, Sweden, although borders are not sacrosanct, that's, but that's a whole other discussion. So what about the word utopian socialism? So I think we need to be visionary and think big, go beyond small reforms. It motivates activism. So to me, utopian may mean, means going beyond what is seen as possible, thinking big. But I think there are two visions of utopianism. One is just a vision without any kind of strategy, just having a great idea. To me, utopian in the positive way, which I hold, is having a vision, but also a strategy uh, to move towards it. So, uh, in, again, cl two uh, closing words, okay. One is, so I'm arguing, and the uh, next speaks will develop in more participatory socialism, participatory economics, participatory society. You can call it libertarian socialism. The name is not so important. The substance is, although we're presenting a specific type of libertarian socialism. I would argue that the word socialism is worth, uh, is worth keeping. Uh, it's a tradition, there's growing acceptance around the world. Even if many people, you know, think of, when they say socialism, they think of like Bernie Sanders, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, but you know, there's a growth of this uh, belief in socialism. And uh, so I argue for it. Again, with the word communism, I differentiate communism with a small c, you know, as developed very briefly by Marx, compared to communism with a capital C, which I've already critiqued. So, uh, the, again, I'm arguing participatory socialism. The last comments I'd like to make, because I'm a minute or two over, I see, is that revolution, to me, is a very positive idea too. But by revolution, I don't necessarily mean violent. I mean the transformation and liberation of society, of all people in that society, not an event but it's a process uh, as much as an outcome. So to me, revolution is a process as much as an outcome. It means the social, social transformation of society, mass transformation, mass participation in the transformation. It's not a coup, but it's a qualitative and quantitative societal change. So the key concept here of revolution is overthrowing capitalist structures, a qualitative break that challenge and ends the power of capital to shape the state, employment, the, ending the power of capital to hold communities hostage, uh, overcoming racism and sexism, and the end of exploitation and capitalist raid. Uh, power to the people. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll turn it over now to Juna. And thanks, Jason. Great, thank you very much, Peter, for that excellent introduction to different versions of socialism. Um, so yeah, next is Yuna, who will be presenting a very specific version of participatory socialism called a participatory economy. Over to you, Yuna. Yes, thank you, and good to be here. And thanks, Peter, for your presentation. Uh, it, it's a it's a tall task to go through so many things in such a short amount of time and i will try to do the same as well in my presentation on, on participatory economy um first i have the slide here of of the values that are behind this model 
as was mentioned earlier, uh, economist Robin Hamel and activist Michael Albert developed this uh, this model, uh, the first version, uh, decades ago, and uh, there were these uh, there were these main values behind the model that I think are worth going through. And the first one is um, you can call it economic democracy. And the main idea behind this value is that uh, you get to have a say in the decisions uh, in proportion to how much they affect you, uh, which means that if you're living close to a factory or some, some other place that is uh, uh, manufacturing pollution or something, uh, you get more say uh, in how you handle that negative effect if you live close to it. But if you if you live somewhere far away and it doesn't affect you, you don't get that much say. So this is a bit of a different way of uh, looking at democracy than the usual one person one one vote. But I think it's it's really important in economic matters because uh, they affect you in different ways and uh, uh, different amounts. Okay, the next value is economic justice, and uh, this means that people should have fair pay. And, uh, and the burdens of economic activity should be uh, shared uh, in a fair manner. And uh, we'll go through them uh, uh, in more detail later. But that's a really important thing in looking at economic models. Okay, the next uh, value is environmental sustainability. Um, a better economic system uh, should have in its roots, in its like, foundation, uh, price signals and allocation systems uh, that um, doesn't make it profitable to emit a lot of greenhouse gases or um, destruct the natural environment. Um, it should be basically incentivized to protect the environment. Uh, nowadays, we have a system that is basically saying to all economic actors, you must pollute, you must emit, um, greenhouse gases, uh, otherwise you're going to get left behind. And we need to change that, uh, the whole mindset and the incentive structure altogether. Okay, the next value is efficiency. And some people don't like it because it, it brings to mind the capitalist mindset and thinking like, uh, what is an efficient market? Well, it means that you have competition and greed and you have the destruction of, of, of the nat nat natural environment. But it, it doesn't really have to be like that. I mean, of course, we want efficiency if the values are correct, if we have a true objective, and if the economy is working as it should, um, then it's really good to be efficient. For example, if you're working towards uh, environmental protection, you want to be as good as you can while doing it. So that, that's what efficiency means, and, and you really need it if the other things are working as they should. The next value is solidarity. And uh, the, <laughs> this is kind of a uh, obvious one, but, but I mean, nowadays we have a capitalist system which, which, makes, uh, which incentivizes people to be competitive and greedy. And greed is good from the uh, Wall Street movie, which I just watched. I, I think it's, really <laughs> it's a really fun, fun movie. But I mean, it, it encapsulates the, the basic uh, capitalist mode of thinking. And uh, we really need a new economic system that um, uh, pushes you to be more uh, mindful of others and not just use your elbows. So that's why we need solidarity. And uh, this, uh, this last one, variety, I've been thinking about it a lot because you can have all these other things maybe, but if it's, uh, if it's only from one mold, if, if you have the same, kind of uh, solutions for everyone. I, I don't think that that would be good for, uh, for everyone. I mean, you need many different ways of going about it. So, so you need to have a structure that is um, flexible enough so you can have lots of different uh, solutions. So we need variety. Okay, here are some main features. And I really liked when Peter said in his pr presentation that, uh, uh, we can't have a uh, like social engineering and really like like this uh, rigid blueprint. Uh, it needs to be tied to the culture and social movements and 
and to the place, to the place and time. And these are some main features uh, from Finnish perspective. I'm from a quite successful like place, Finland, sort of a progressive darling internationally. Uh, many people feel like the Finnish Swedish model of social democracy is it's, it's the best we can have at the moment. And in, in many ways, I agree with it. But here are some main features that are really important in a participatory economy from a Finnish perspective. So first of all, markets are replaced with democratic planning. Uh, I will talk about it later in, in a bit more detail, but this means that the whole pricing system and allocation of resources, it's not handled by like the buyer and the seller are negotiating and that's just how you do it. No, you get, you, you get more democratic involvement and uh, I will talk about it later. You have balanced jobs. Um, this means that um, it's much more equal the way, uh, like, like people's working lives are much more balanced. Nowadays, some people have really repetitive tasks, are really menial tasks. And uh, on top of that, they get quite low pay. And some people are in very empowering jobs and, uh, and they get like, much more pay than the others. So this is unequal and it's not even efficient. It's unfair and it's, uh, it's not efficient. So we need to balance, balance jobs. Uh, one, other, one other thing in a participatory economy is complete, a complete uh, reshifting of focus. Uh, the economic, like the, the whole mindset is not on private ownership, it's about access rights. And they are not eternal or like very long in a way that private ownership is nowadays. I mean, you can negotiate access rights for some uh, resource that is publicly owned. You have social ownership of it, but you get the rights to access it. You can use it to do something very useful. But after you are, you are done with it, um, then you can transfer access rights to some other endeavor. And uh, democratic planning handles uh, the allocation of these access rights. Okay, the next thing, is, the main feature uh, from my perspective is that the whole economic model of participatory economy is based on democratic workplaces. And these workplaces, you can call them councils, worker councils, you can call them uh, firms or enterprises or, or whatever you will, but they are autonomous. So they get to decide how they go about their business, how they go about their production. But they, at the same time that they are autonomous, they cooperate with other producers and consumers. And there is this iterative uh, planning process that handles all this information. And it's all based on a nested structure, which means that all the small firms and producers, and at the same time, the neighborhoods, all the households that belong to their neighborhoods, uh, they at the same time, they are doing their own plans and living their regular everyday lives. They also are part of something bigger. So for example, if you're working in a small firm, you're part of a bigger federation or, or something else that consists of firms that are doing sort of the same thing. So you can have delegates on the upper levels and then you can have decisions, like bigger decisions made there. So let's see what's the next slide. It's about planning, democratic planning. So the firms, enterprises, worker councils, uh, whatever word you wanna use, they receive resources depending on supply and demand. They receive these uh, resources from consumers, neighborhoods, and municipalities. Uh, I use these words because they fit Finland and our st structure of decision making here. But I mean, you can have this, this model is flexible. You can have different amounts of levels and amount of uh, uh, institutions or groups in them. So you, you don't have to use this like Finnish uh, examples if you don't want to. This is flexible enough so you can, you can fit it to different places and, uh, different ways of doing things. And the democratic planning process 
It's a continuous process. It's iterative, so you get uh, many rounds where there is open access to pricing and cost structures. Because nowadays in capitalism, firms have an incentive to keep all the relevant knowledge to themselves, uh, which hinders innovation and uh, has lots of, lots of many problems. Um, and positive and negative externalities are baked in the prices during the planning process, which means that you get much, much better prices because nowadays in, in capitalist market economies, uh, you have this one damaging good. Uh, for example, like the classic example is, is, is like, uh, like petroleum or something. And there are huge negative externalities uh, when you produce it, then when you ship it, and when you burn it. Um, and they are not included in the price unless the state comes in and taxes it afterwards. But it's a, it, it's a really big hassle because you always have to do it afterwards and there is always political like um, fight over it how much you want how much you can raise the taxes and there is lobbying and everything but in in a participatory economy you can base these externalities straight into the prices when you're planning the economic activity okay so here you can see a, a an, an image of the planning process uh, this is a bit simplified but the main idea is that workers on the left side, like the firms, they have their proposal of what they're going to do, how they are going to do it, what resources, to, what resources do they need. And on the other side, consumers and groups of consumers, they have their own plan. And this doesn't mean that everyone has to choose like specific shoes or specific toothbrushes or anything. It just means like categories of, of like big things you're going to get. Like if, if next year we're going to, we're going to need something, some, some major new, new thing or some big service, we need more of it. You can, you can say it to the planning process, like next year is going to be a bit different. And this IFB uh, facilitation board, they are sort of like the statistics bureau. They don't have any political power or decision-making power. They are just collecting the data and uh, pushing it forward. So basically they collect all the data from the economic actors and uh, they release new prices. They just calculate the supply and demand. And if some things are in, in higher demand, then it affects prices and, and so on. But the basic thing is, people on both sides of this uh, image as consumers and workers, uh, they give their proposals, they look at the new prices, and then they make choices. And when the supply and demand is, uh, when they meet, then you have a real plan that, that you can go on and, and, and do it. Um, and of course, this is not a separate process from all other economic activity you can at the same time be producing and plan the next round. That's what firms are doing at the moment. But this is just to uh, make it a bit easier to, to um, comprehend. Okay, um, next thing is balancing work. Uh, I, I feel like at least in Finland, one often neglected aspect of inequality is work and working life in general. Um, there is a lot of talk of income inequality and wealth inequality, but not that much about jobs. Uh, I have this example here, which is of an intern in a law firm versus a cleaner. Uh, this is a real example from like people I know. So uh, at least it, it, uh, it fits here in Finland. Um, I know this intern in a law firm and she doesn't have that uh, like high income. She's still working as an intern. Um, and there's a cleaner at that office and she even has like bigger pay than the, than the intern. But it, it, even though the income is much, a bit higher uh, on the cleaning side, you get so much more empowerment, necessary information, and your like career prospects are so much higher as an intern in a law firm. So, uh, like 
when when these things develop over time it's uh, it's it's quite obvious that all the other stuff that you get as working as an intern in a law firm it's 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 very valuable and what i'm what i'm trying to get to here is that um some jobs are very repetitive they have menial tasks and they don't they don't really empower you to network with other people uh people with power people with decision making power and you don't really get those like uh, necessary um skills of like handling all the decision making and that should be changed and in a participatory economy workplaces are democratic and work is balanced and what this means in practice is that everyone gets a job that in that includes some tasks that are more empowering and some tasks that are less and it doesn't mean that everyone does everything but there should be a balance and uh, there are many ways of many ways of doing this but this is the main main idea the main value that the work life should be more balanced okay next we're going to talk about income so how are people rewarded for their efforts um currently in in capitalist market societies um uh, remuneration uh is is based on many unjust factors. I have mentioned luck and privilege here, but there are many, many other factors as well, which are not related to like the things you can in influence yourself. Um, a just um, system for, for remunerating people should be based on things that you can influence yourself. And uh, in this model, Hanel and Albert, they, they argue for uh, rewarding effort and sacrifice because those are the things that everyone can influence themselves and they also have a direct um, uh, how do you say correlation with contribution so if you want people to be rewarded for their contribution uh, everyone contributes more when they're given more effort so um, this is this is a just way of um, um rewarding economic activity and uh, because their workplaces are uh, autonomous they can use different approaches to implement all this so here you can see in this table like the main institutions of the present day economic system capitalism and a participatory economy so in capitalism you have private ownership and i really like the way Peter um, like went through this, uh, like like what does it mean private ownership? It doesn't mean like your personal belongings. It's it's the it's a thing you can make money out of it. It's the it's the productive productive uh, uh, capital. So in a participatory economy, you have social ownership of resources, or what some people call call the commons, um, and you have democratic planning of these access rights to the resources you have balanced work you have participatory decision making you have compensation based on effort and sacrifice and markets are replaced with democratic participatory plan uh, i mentioned some expected outcomes next because i think it's really important to have an idea of okay what's what's it going to look like in a participatory economy but these are only my kind of, it's my analysis. Um, but in my view, prices of damaging goods would skyrocket in a, in a participatory economy because the prices would include all the bad stuff from production, emissions, pollution, biodiversity loss, and many others. And it would work the other, uh, other way around as well. Um, if you have some goods or services that have positive uh, externalities, like they are really good for, for the environment, or they they are really good for uh, like for for your health or something. Uh, you could bake those in the prices, and uh, they would be cheaper. Nowadays, the prices are exactly the opposite. If you want to buy something that is responsibly made, it costs a lot. So that's something that needs to change in a in a better pricing system. 
okay, there would also be much less inequality in income and in wealth because it's based on effort and sacrifice. And also because the work life is balanced in other ways as well, in total, there would be much less inequality. And this is something that I believe is very important uh, when, when thinking about a new economy. Uh, because in, in a participatory economy, collective consumption would be much more accessible than now. Private purchases would be much more expensive uh, because environmental and social effects uh, would be accounted for. And collective consumption, like public parks or public renting services for equipment or, or whatever, they would be much less expensive. And this would enable much more public luxury. Um, and it's good for the environment because public uh, versions of these things are usually much more uh, sustainable because the emissions and pollution per person is much less than if everyone buys their own trampoline or their own car or their own electric bike and so on. We have some examples of this in Finland. For example, libraries loaning out electric bikes and these sort of things. So they would be expanded, I think, in a democratic planned economy. Okay, uh, to, to recap, and he, here is my three takeaways. Uh, there is a just, sustainable and efficient alternative to capitalism, because this is the main thing we, we get asked a lot. I mean, we know capitalism is, 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 is really problematic, but what can we, what can we have that is better and would work really well? Well, in theory, at least, a participatory economy is much better. We need a concrete um, experimentation with it to know how it would work in practice. But in theory, in simulations, it, it, works, it works very well. And we need to change our consumption habits, less private, more public, more collective consumption. And uh, my final, final point is that the economy can be democratic and participatory, and it is much better for the climate and biodiversity. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Yuna, for introducing the key goals and features of, a, of the participatory economy model. Following on from your last takeaway, we have Finton, who will be talking about a participatory economy and environmentalism. So over to you, Finton. If you can unmute yourself. Yeah, unmute it now. Great, um, thank you. Uh, okay. So <clears throat> just to start off with uh, two provisos, um, it's unlikely that uh, uh, to be possible to achieve a participatory economy in time to address the issue of climate change. Uh, but it can inform our current thinking and vision so that we have an environment to be sustained. Um, uh, we will have a well thought out means to do that, to do that in the future. Uh, a Green New Deal represents the best approach to stave off catastrophic environmental disaster in the shorter term. And this is achievable within a capitalist model, but also can point us towards the kind of reforms necessary to build a participatory economy. Um, and Chomsky and Pollan's book on that is uh, worth looking at. Uh, one of the key values on which a participatory economy is based is environmental sustainability. This value, along with the values of solidarity, diversity, equity, efficiency, and self-management, are fundamental to how a participatory economy can protect and enhance the environment. A society implementing a participatory economy is likely to be already elevating the relative significance of environmental sustainability as compared to a market system if it seeks an alternative based on the values described above. An economy seeking solidarity cannot avoid seeking solidarity with future generations. An economy concerned with diversity cannot act in such a way that reduces biodiversity, and an efficient economy cannot waste finite resources. So I just want to look at how a market system currently fails the environment, and then we can compare that to how uh, a participatory society will uh, mediate these ills. So um, uh, 
market system currently uh, has unreflective prices and it ignores externalities. So by this, prices in the market system are based on the power that buyers and sellers can exert over one another and their ability to avoid paying the social costs of their transaction and instead offloading them onto others in the environment. This means the prices don't reflect the true cost of goods in a market system. Uh, market actors, sorry, um, uh, seeking to increase profits and decrease costs will try to find ways to dump the social costs associated with the production of a good into the least protected uh, actor in the exchange, for example, labour or the environment, whichever is the least resistant to bearing the cost. There is also no incentive to report the extent of damage caused by the externality avoided. The fact that it is incumbent on actors in a market system to seek ways to avoid paying true social costs means that a market system relies on Pigovian taxes to address effects of these externalities. Yet, market economies provide no measurable information about how much damage pollution causes, so the taxes cannot redistribute the costs and benefits of tr transactions equitably. So an example of this is, uh, or to illustrate this point, uh, just uh, look at how a car is bought and sold. Um, so buying and selling a car in a market system ignores externalities involving the production of a vehicle and the consumption of a vehicle, such as air pollution, noise pollution, traffic congestion, greenhouse gases, etc. Sidelining these externalities greatly increases the benefit for the buyer and seller in the transaction, while shifting considerable collective negative effects on many others. Difficulty associated with representing all affected parties in this transaction is overwhelming within a market system, so it is regularly ignored and individual buyers and sellers reap the benefits while the social costs are borne by everybody else. Competition in a market system amplifies this problem as actors seek to maximise profits and minimise costs to greater extents. Thus, the, the unrepresented parties in the transaction will be the ones that continue to bear the increasing costs borne out by the increase in competition. Uh, market systems prioritise increasing personal consumption above public goods given the greater profit that can be derived from personal consumption vis-a-vis -vis public goods. Furthermore, as a result of a com uh, competition in a market system, whether there's private ownership of productive assets, uh, whether they are factories, equipment, intellectual property rights, uh, means that efficiency gains are not shared fairly within an economy. Beneficial gains made in one company that could increase productivity and create less waste are hoarded as a means to gain competitive advantage rather than shared so as to prevent pollution. This imbalance means that markets will tend to overproduce goods and services that are harm harmful to the environment, so that uh, even if it may be necessary to pollute somewhat during production of any good, a given good or service, such as, uh, such as if the benefit derived from those goods or services is greater than the cost of producing them, including the damage from pollution, markets will lead us to pollute far more than is beneficial to anything other than private profit. So, just want to look now at uh, a participatory economy and how that um, can create a sustainable environment. So a participatory economy is not just about protecting the environment for the use of current inhabitants of the, of the earth, but also seeks solidarity and sustainability for the future generations. It is an economy capable of being uh, in solidarity with future generations by accounting for the social cost of production through the participatory planning of the economy. Not only by addressing immediate social cost of production and consumption, but also by equity planning for the future costs and benefits. Competition is removed from the economy because participatory planning removes the ability for firms to compete, thus reducing one of the main drivers of overproduction and inefficiency. All productive assets are socially owned. This means that research and development gains, more efficient production techniques, equipment and resource uses are shared amongst the whole of the economy and not hoarded to enhance profit making. The profit in, uh, incentive to externalise costs is removed. Uh, participatory planning promotes public goods over personal consumption, as Jona already mentioned. Planning involves worker councils and consumer councils engaging in an iterative process by which an agreed plan for the economy would be reached. In creating this plan, individuals in, the cons in consumer councils must make cost requests for items to be produced. And the council's request for public goods will be considered first before requests for private goods from individuals within the consumer council. Prices for goods and services in a participatory economy reflect the true cost, including the social costs, such as pollution associated with them. 
they are arrived at through the participatory planning process. This removes the power imbalance between producers and consumers that causes them to seek to sideline social costs. Furthermore, because the externalities are factored into prices, more polluting items will be costlier and less attractive to consume. Prices in a participatory economy are arrived at through an iterative process between worker councils and consumer councils. councils. <coughs> to deal with uh, qualifying, uh, quantifying pollution as a social cost of production, within this process, Robin Hanel proposes a pollution demand revealing mechanism to reach fair and efficient levels of emissions. This involves the creation of communities of affected parties, CAPs, in order to aid um, ascertaining an equitable estimation for the social cost of pollutants. CAPs compromise uh, those people who are affected by a given pollutant. CAPs decide how many units of pollutant they are willing to permit, if any. Members of the CAP then receive compensation relative in value to the sacrifice they have made in allowing themselves to be affected by a pollutant, based on an estimate of the damage caused per unit emitted during the annual planning process. The, effects, the efficient level of pollution is the level at which uh, the cost of the last unit emitted, the damages to all victims, is equal to the benefit from the last unit emitted, the satisfaction consumers gain from the additional goods and services that can be produced because an additional unit of emission was permitted. While there may be perverse incentives to claim to be affected by a pollutant, even if you are not, in order to claim comp compensation, this is matched by the desire of participants in a cap to restrict membership only to those affected so that they claim their legitimate compensation in full without it being devalued by illegitimate claims. Uh, and environmental courts could be used to adjudicate disputes over membership of CAPs. Uh, Long-run environmental planning. Finally, seeking solidarity with future generations is relevant to any discussion on the environment. To this end, Anel has developed a proposal for long-run environmental planning within a participatory economy. Long-run environmental planning entails deciding how much to invest in environmental protection relative to how to, uh, how to consume each year uh, in such a way that the present generation fairly takes the interests of future generations into account by not overpolluting now to the detriment of future generations, and that any mistakes made in setting pollution targets can be detected and corrected during the long run plan. National federations of consumer councils, along with industry federations or worker councils, must be tasked with assessing the value of environmental amenities versus the benefits of more consumption and with assessing how much changes in natural capital will affect future production in their industries. A political entity such as the Ministry for the Environment can estimate the cost of environmental protection and enhancement. Future generations cannot form caps to determine the costs associated with polluting now and future consequences, so Hanel proposes a generational equity uh, constraint as a means to balance the benefits and costs to current and future generations. This involves the current generation voting on a limit from which the, the uh, consumption can deviate from year to year. Assuming no huge differences in how different generations value consumption goods compared to environmental amenities, the efficient long-run environmental plan, i.e. how much consumption differs over time, depends on how much environmental deterioration does or does not reduce future production. If it significantly reduces future production, environmental investment can be increased, and if it barely affects future production, investment can be low. To attain an equitable environmental plan, it is beneficial for a current generation to maintain a small deviation in consumption, thus resulting in less of an increase in production goods and also protecting resources for future generations without unfairly impacting future generations. The Ministry of Environment can produce a plan for an efficient long-run investment based on the estimates provided by the federations and guided by the GEC. The plan could be voted on by a national referendum. The accuracy of the Ministry's plan will be revealed by the resultant future annual plans and investment in the environment can be adjusted accordingly. And uh, if you want to have a more detailed exposition of the uh, pollution demand revealing mechanism and long-run environmental planning, uh, panel 07P1 at this conference, or uh, Robin's latest book, Democratic Economic Planning, uh, cover this in great detail. Thanks. Great, thank you very much, Vincent.
There is also a panel on Thursday called Democratic Planning in the Environment, which is dedicated specifically to this, if you want to find out more about this particular uh, topic. Right. Um, we have about 25 minutes left. So if you'd like to ask a question to any of the speakers, on the right side of the screen is a Q&A tab. So please ask your questions directly into the chat there, not the chat, the Q&A tab. Or if you'd like to ask directly, please just make yourself known and um, we will turn your camera on. So there's one question we have so far, which I will read out by Alexandria. She asks, do you find there is more receptiveness to participatory economy or Paracon, as it's known for short, in Finland, or less compared to less socialized countries? Is there less of a fear of moving away from capitalism? Yuna, would you like to yeah, sure. address that one? Um, th this is an interesting one and a tricky one. Uh, I would say that in Finland, people are really interesting, uh, are really interested in the idea of, of what what could we have that is even better than what we have now like what what could be the next step for social democracy and many people in finland we have we have been um presenting this model for like 10 years and usually when people hear about it they are really interested in it. they are not they are not like like no way they are they're really interested in it but um there really is a fear of moving away from capitalism or it, I don't think it's that either. It's it's more like because we have been um, like we are neighbors to Russia, and uh, like Finland was in a in a war with with Soviet Union, so uh, like the Finnish are really anti-communist. Uh, we have a strong left party. We even have a communist party, and after the wars in the 40s and 50s, this communist party was pretty strong. But we have a very, um, I would say, uh, like difficult history with 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 these things. So I, I would say that they are really interested in in pushing the social democracy forward, and 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 the socialism in Finland forward. But here, communism and socialism, they are very much um, like attached to Soviet Union and the history of authoritarian um, communism. So, so I would say that uh, there are like very positive things in representing this in Finland, but also some real challenges because people are so so um, anti-socialist because of this history. Okay, uh, Finton or Peter, would you like to add anything to that? Um, the re the reaction to talking about capitalist alternatives in your respective countries. Okay, I'll go, uh, maybe Fintan next. So it does seem in the United States over the last, I don't know, 20 to 30 years, there really is a growing understanding that capitalism is a really oppressive, exploitive system of human beings globally, the environment as Fintan was uh, developing in UNA, and a more of an openness to alternatives, even though still the view of there is no alternative is very, very striking. Among a lot of Poles, you know, among African Americans, among young people, and among women, there's more of an openness to socialism, well, less, more pro-socialist than pro-capitalist these days, in a lot of the Pew Poles, P-E-W. So I do think there's an opening, you know, again, I'll hopefully get to the next question about the strategy. That seems a difficult to view that how can we achieve this? But I do find an openness, even if the social movements, like movements that are really advocating for some kind of social in the way we're talking about it, are not that strong. I feel in the population as a whole, there's a, a really growing uh, interest in alternatives. You know, I do a lot of talking kind of all over the country and I find a real interest uh, in some of these ideas that we're presenting today. Okay, 
Yeah, I think my answer would be fairly similar to Peter. There is an increase in the interest in uh, seeking alternatives, but there is a kind of underlying kind of concern that there there aren't viable alternatives, or there there isn't isn't one. Um, um, I, yeah, I mean, young people here as well. I think are. Um, more receptive to alternative models of uh, an economy or the need for it. Uh, the environment is a is a kind of a, a heightening factor in um, in raising awareness of the need to change how we manage the economy. But uh, yeah, I think that kind of summarises the situation in general. Anyway. Okay, uh, another question we have by Professor Shailendra, who asks, while the principles are clear, how exactly does a participatory economy get ushered in? And also, just as a name does not make a country socialist, mere principles cannot usher in a real participatory economy. So I think there's a question about strategy how do we get there and secondly are our principles and values enough alone i hope i'm formulating that question correctly right um who would like to reply to that first just do you want to put your finger up okay peter please go ahead okay so when I think of um, kind of revolutionary transformative change, we need a very strong critique of capitalism. We need some vision of alternative. And then thirdly, we need a strategy to connect the critique to where we want to go. I think often the left, particularly academic left, has focused too much on the critique of capitalism and not enough on the vision and the alternative and the strategy. We've talked some about the vision, but probably the strategy to me is the most important and difficult. What's connecting it to that's what I call the difference between the bad view of utopianism and a positive view that is strategy. So, uh, in terms of strategy, it's how do we have this growing interest in alternative well, capitalism, but not really represented in significant movements. I'll talk mainly about the US, even though I spent a lot of time in Latin America also and i i really like the idea which i'm going to talk about in another panel non-reforms reforms building power building consciousness meeting people's needs but always showing the limits of uh of the existing capitalist system the need to go beyond it and i look at a lot of kind of social movements together with maybe political party of a new type a party that has not a vanguard party, but a party that has a vision of a different society that's mainly movement based, electoral based, a very, very small part of it that really connects this vision and the critique of capitalism to some of the really important movements in the environmental justice movement, the really growth of racial justice, uh, uh, gender justice, sexual justice movements. These movements together uh, with uh, a party of a new type seems to me can create a block uh, of more and more people who are really disenfranchised by the system who's seeing an alternative is both necessary and desirable. So those forces seem weak now, but I do see really possibilities. You know, even groups like, and finally, like DSA, United States Democratic Socialist America, very much growing because of Bernie Sanders, even though there are many divisions, most don't have a specific socialist view. I think it's a vision uh, that can be connected to real movements in a way that hasn't happened, but is possible. So I'm an optimist in the long run, even though, like Fenton was saying, one of the problems is that climate justice has a very different time frame from probably revolutionary change to history socialism. I think public education yes. is really important. I'll stop. I want to add really sharing these ideas in a not a top-down way but a pop education way is really important too 
Uh, Yuna. Yeah, Peter touched on the social movement side of, of, of the answer for this question, I, I think really, really well. But may, maybe I could continue with the more technical side. Um, uh, me and my colleagues have, have uh, researched the, the sort of steps that you could take, the reforms that you could do in a Nordic social democracy and how to pave the way for something like a real participatory economy. And it's, it's interesting to, to see that in Finland, especially, uh, we have this social uh, municipality housing, which already incorporates this nested structure where people can decide and they, they, they are public, the, the housing is publicly owned and they have these democratic councils that can uh, decide on budgeting. And we have, we have a really big public sector compared to many other countries, almost all the other countries in the world. And the public sector could have these sort of trials of these participatory planning things because we have publicly uh, controlled and owned companies. Uh, we have huge consumers like schools, libraries, uh, hospitals, uh, all, all the public agencies and, and, and bureaus. Um, they are they are huge consumers, and they are also uh, there are so many huge producers, uh, publicly controlled or owned in Finland. So they could all participate in a sort of a trial run of this sort of participatory planning. And we we sort of have the we have the pieces here, but at the moment we don't have enough political pressure. We don't have the political movement to do it, and. I also think that we don't have the ambition right now in Finland. I think like we're one of the, uh, like I would say, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I feel like we're, we're one, of the, one of the best economies in the world when you look at uh, low child poverty rates, our education levels are high. We have, we have lots of good things going on here, but many people in Finland think like we should look for somewhere else for inspiration. We should be more like Switzerland or Norway or Sweden or, or some other countries. Some people feel like the US, even though I, I disagree uh, vehemently. But uh, we don't have the ambition to be like the first ones to try something. We're sort of like, uh, we're waiting for someone else to, to make the next step and then we, we could uh, follow along. But I would, I would say that we need more ambition. We should be the ones uh, trying these things out. Uh, great. Um, Vincent, do you want, would you like to add anything or should I go to our next question? No, no, I mean, just, uh, yeah, kind of uh, social democratic reforms, uh, in increasing worker participation in management of companies, um, supporting co-ops, uh, but while also acknowledging that um, these reforms have limits and, and, and the dangers of just settling on these reforms. I think that's kind of I mean, everybody mentioned those before, but that's that's just what I did. Okay, Juan Sebastian asks, how do you envis envision the role of technology in the implementation of a participatory economy? Who would like to go first? You know, go ahead. Um. Well, that I feel like the model in itself um, works really well, even with 90s technology. I mean, you don't you don't really need that much technology for this to work. But I mean, with with modern technologies, with with artificial intelligence and smart learning and all these other things, um, they could make the the, the, when I showed you the picture of, of how it all works, we have this facilitation board in the middle. And I think these new algorithms, they could basically handle all, all of that automatically. So basically the transfer of data and calculating the new prices, uh, that would be much faster nowadays than, than I think uh, Hanel and Albert uh, envisioned in, in the 90s. So I think that uh, the, the modern like the IT revolution, it really helps this model, even though it's not required for it to work. Uh, 
Okay. Um, let me actually add something to that, which is um, that um, a few a few of us in the in the participatory economy project um, started work on a computer simulation of participatory planning. A software developer called Mitchell Sechapanchik has actually um, created an agent-based simulation and has scaled it up to include thousands of worker and consumer councils. Um, and um, if you want to find out a bit more about that, I will put a link down into the into the chat below. And I think Mitchell will, will be presenting his simulation during the um, environmental planning um, workshop and maybe currently in the democratic economic planning workshop, which is, I believe, just started. Um, yeah, Peter. Okay, so just add a little bit to what Yuna and Jason said. Yeah, it seems this information going back and forth so that can really have participatory planning as opposed to the the market or the demo or the central planning seems to it could be really made more possible by the development of, of uh, computer technology. And I would also add maybe a second point that hasn't been mentioned uh, by the first two people who just spoke is that you know there's a lot of debate how you know substantial automation is, but you know it is real in certainly many many industries. And now often automation can be a very negative factor in the capital society because people losing their jobs, workers you know competing against each other like a race to the bottom. But in a participatory economy, the idea, for example, uh, jobs that are like the remote jobs that Yuna was talking about, that those could be automated. We really could have society where people worked a lot less hours today. I've made estimates of 10 to 15 hours a week, maybe more if we include work in a household, like maybe 25 to 30, but still have so much more time to pursue their interests. So again, a lot of the technological change that's going on could be positive in a good society, but it's often so destructive today. I want to add one more thing, if that's okay, from the last this discussion about strategy. I know the theme for tomorrow is decommodifying. And in terms of thinking of these non reformist reforms that we were speaking about in the last question, the idea of trying to push for decommodifications, such as free public transportation, uh, making goods available to all, uh, food, health care. I guess the idea of decommodification, I do want to add as part of the strategy about non reformist reforms. Okay, great. So we have five minutes left. I can't see any more questions at the moment. Um, so I have put a link into the chat if you want to find out more about the simulation project that's okay. going on. And also I'll put a link to the participatory economy website where you can find out more information about the model. Um, there's a extensive frequently asked questions section in a community forum as well in a, a monthly newsletter. Uh, let's see, we can probably take one more quick question. So um, a question by Thomas, how is it ensured that the, the facilitation board that uh, is part of the participatory planning procedure, um, how is it ensured that they're not getting any decision power because of having more knowledge? So, Yuna, if you want to answer that in a couple of minutes. Yeah, well, it's, it might be even shorter than that. I mean, the whole whole, stru whole structure is designed that they cannot have any, any say in those because there is no decisions to be made. They just handle the information. And if the information is openly accessed, uh, as it is in this model, then like, everyone can, can check it out. And like nowadays you do with bugs in, in computer software. I mean, if it is public and you can go and, and check the source code, someone will find it <laughs> if, if someone is, is finagling with the data. So um, uh, if it is uh, implemented as planned, 
um, there really should be no problem with that. Okay, very good. Um, so we can sort of slowly wrap up there. Would, um, yeah, would everyone like to say a few closing words um, for, for a minute each? And, and then we can finish. I mean, I was going to ask um, also if there are any real world examples anyone might want to kind of look at where we can see a participatory economy principles being enacted in the real world or either historically or in the world today. Um, but yeah, we have four minutes, so I'll leave it, I'll leave it up to you. Um, Peter, would you, would you like to go first? So on your last comment, uh, I visited some of the Zapatista communities of the EZLM in Chiapas in 18, and even though, again, they're within a much larger capitalist economy of Mexico, some of these principles about rotation of work, some of the things Una was talking about are there. So let me just mention that. Rojava, I think, is also worth looking about uh, the Kurdish area in northern Syria. The last a point I'd like to make, I was thinking about you know, kind of a contradiction under history socialism and you know, it's discussed it's between the individual and the collective. To me, that seems like a really interesting and important, I would call it dialectic, where if we only consider the individual, we don't deal with collective needs. But I think there are there is the variety that Yuna was talking about the principles. So I think we need to think of this kind of contrast between the individual and the collective. And I guess connect to that, I see, for example, uh, Yuna, you mentioned libraries. I would see a lot of these goods like cars, it'd be libraries, like the if collective, you needed a, a car to go on an excursion, you wouldn't have many because of environmental reasons, but there'd be a library for so many things, I think could be a way of making societies more sustainable, generalizing that principle. Great, thanks Peter. Finton? Um, yeah, I think, um, as well as the economy, I think we we need other supporting institutions, um, such as in the, the political sphere. And um, uh, Steve Shalom has in, has, uh, has developed a, a similar model for the uh, for the political sphere, sphere as this is for the economy. Uh, that's well worth looking into. And then, of course, um, in uh, in interpersonal relations in, 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 the, in the you know uh, realms of racism, sexism. Uh, I think uh, we need to develop um, similar supporting structures so that you can't really have changes in the economy, in, in the economy and other changes in, 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 in wider society that are mutually supportive. Okay, great. Thanks, Vinton. And uh, final comment, Una. We only have a minute left. Yeah, I will be brief. Uh, I saw that Thomas Turner had this asked question, asked this question, would the schools be even better in a participatory economy than in Finland right now? And as a Finnish school teacher, <laughs> I, I can, I can say <laughs> uh, that definitely, I mean, we have a really horizontal autonomous participatory uh, school system. Teachers have a lot, a lot of freedom, but we're still working in a capitalist market market society. So we, we really feel the pressure. Uh, so um, I would feel much better and I would be even more productive and inspiring teacher if, if I was teaching inside a participatory economy and and political system as well as Finn, Finton mentioned. So definitely. Great. Well, um, thank you everybody for attending. Thank you to our speakers, Peter, Yuna, Finton and uh, moderator Billy. Um, if you'd like to find out more about participatory economy model, please visit participatoryeconomy.org and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jason, too. Thank you very much. Thank you, yeah. Jason. Thanks. Yeah. And Billy. <laughs>